So today we're going to be having an exciting webinar on personalized nutrition through vertical farming. And we've developed a really exciting mix of speakers, which I'll introduce shortly. And I definitely invite you to check them out, check out their social media, see what they're all about and get to know them a little bit better on LinkedIn as well. You'll hear the names of the speakers coming up soon. But first, let's just talk about some basic uh, Zoom etiquette. Uh, introduce yourself in our group chat so we can get to know you. Think about your intention for the event today, for this webinar. What do you hope to learn? Uh, what are you looking to ask? We do have a questions feature, which we invite you to use to ask questions. The best way to ask those questions that we can work through them and get through them. And at the end of the webinar, we're gonna be answering some of the best questions. So please uh, share them with us. And depending on how we get through them, we'll also try to answer some that we don't get to today in maybe a follow-up newsletter. And we also invite you to participate in the polls that are gonna be coming. We're gonna be testing your knowledge of nutrition and history of nutrition. So it's coming up later on the webinar and we want your answers to that. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Henry Gordon Smith, the founder and CEO of Agritecture. And I am really excited to speak about ag tech and moderate this event. Um, I'm also a nomad. I travel the world visiting farms and tours. You can see that on my Instagram, the Agritect. It's one of my favorite things to do is to learn about what different farms are doing. In fact, uh, yesterday I got to visit a new vertical farm in Lisbon and see what they're up to and how they're starting up and experimenting with this. I also am a consultant with Agritecture Consulting where we help plan farms all around the world and advise on various market studies and due diligence for investors. And I'd like to consider myself a team leader. My mom is an HR manager and she says, the most important thing is your people. And I believe that. And I think that that's what I try to focus on at our company. But I'm really excited about today's event and the various speakers we have. So first off, let me just pull up the bios a little bit, but I'm gonna introduce uh, Jade Stinson. Now, Jade Stinson is the co-founder and president at Vindara. Vindara delivers seeds specifically designed for the use in vertical indoor farms and is the key for pushing the market projections even further, removing limitations that traditional seeds impose and giving growers, retailers, and consumers greater control over their produce. So really an amazing speaker we're so happy to have here um, to learn about that aspect related to vertical farming and personalized nutrition. Now, Mark Kozilius is stuck on a plane right now, but he's coming soon, hopefully. Um, so instead, in his place, we have Franz Drack, who you can see here. And Franz Drack worked at Coca-Cola and L'Oreal, also worked at some other companies and in various sales and marketing positions. And he's new to Andever, which is a vertical farming company headquartered in Munich, but with operations in Kuwait and Singapore. So really excited to have you here as well, Franz. Thank you so much. And you also worked at Lego, lots of exciting sort of market aspects to this as well. And you're the CMO now at Andever. Congratulations on that new role. Thank you. And we have Larissa Zimbaroff. And let me pull that one up here. Journalist and author of Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. In a moment, we'll hear a little bit about that. Larissa is a freelance journalist and author covering the intersection of food, technology, and business. Her book, Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley, Mission to Change the Way We Eat, is out now. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And before I get into that, I want to say, uh, Larissa also has an amazing newsletter that goes out every Friday. It covers all the latest news. It's fun to read. It's really exciting. And as we transition into talking a bit about your book in a moment, Larissa, um, I'll sort of talk about how, what I felt about that intro. First, let's go over to Jade. I just want to allow you to introduce yourself briefly, Jade. Yeah, Jade Stinson, um, thanks for the introduction, Henry. Uh, originally from the UK, deep ag background, and um, was following the vertical indoor farming space. And, um, you know, realized after doing a little bit of diligence stealthily that the seeds were bred for a very different environment. So, you know, we founded Vindara on this uh, thesis of, you know, could we be the elite genetics provider for this space? Fantastic. When you say deep ag background, can you tell me what that means? Does that mean like, <laughs> Like what, yeah. what is deep so, uh, Yeah, research, like my research was on potatoes. Um, I've looked at the link between mad cow disease and humans and, you know, contracting new variant CJD. Um, I spent 10 years with BSF, um, both in their performance chemicals and then their agriculture okay. products division, yeah. So big, big ag could be another way to say it, right? A lot of those sound like big ag too. Yeah, that's true, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's cool. That is really, we're really happy to have your experience and attention to the vertical farming sector that I think is close to all of our 
hearts. Thanks for being here, Jade. Thanks. Let's move over to Andever. Maybe just brief introduction on Andever here, France, and then we'll move yes, into sure. the next slide. Mm -hmm. So in Endeavor, we are an indoor vertical farming company. We are based in Munich at the moment and have operations in Germany, Kuwait, and Singapore at the moment. And we have very much focused, I mean, we've been around since 2015 and have developed some very specific and exclusive technology, especially around climate cell, climate control, but also on the way how we actually grow our greens. And this has also an impact on the nutritional value of the greens. And that's what I'm going to talk about later on a little bit. Fantastic. And this is something actually that was provided by Endeavor. Do you want to talk about this a little bit? What are, yes, what are we exactly. At here? Uh, as you can see, like we have, uh, we have our proprietary technology that is called triponics. And uh, when you look at this, at, at the picture, we did an analysis a few, uh, a few months ago where we basically looked at the different uh, kind of vitamin C levels uh, of, uh, of our produce compared to other produce. And we could clearly see that when you produce uh, like greens with the triponics method, you actually have a higher vitamin C and vitamin A and vitamin E levels. So this is actually some more higher value in terms of the, yeah, what we can actually produce with it. And it was a little bit like this that we had, we were engineering the triponics approach to that. And it was basically an outcome of, of this approach. So it was not that we were looking and said, we want to have like 100% more like vitamin C in the product. But we said like, how can we build an environment where the, where the, where the plant is almost like in a spa and has the perfect conditions to grow. And this is a little bit like, this is the outcome that you have from that, you know? So, and we see, we have a, sim a similar research also when we compare to, for example, our products uh, with classical organic uh, food or with classical supermarket greens, we have much higher kind of protein. We have, we have also higher kind of, you know, uh, nutritional values that, that are basically come out of that, that we are growing this in, in, in a very controlled environment. And we can really, and, and this is the reason why we think this is, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's better food. So uh, it's, I think the, the cool thing about it is it's not, it's, it's not processed food to achieve this. It's basically just like unprocessed food that grows in a better environment and can then outperform basically other, other offers in the market. And that's why we are so excited about this. Yeah, I think, I think your analogy or your, your metaphor of the spa makes, makes some sense, right? You're sort of creating the environment for peacefulness and performance exactly. for yeah, the plant. Exactly. And I, I think a lot of people think of plants outside and you're like, well, that's natural. That's where they want to be, right? That's their best condition. But there's a lot of variables they're experiencing that stress them out. I mean, even us, we like to be indoors. We like to have the right climate control that makes us perform better. So that sort of helps people in basic, uh, get a basic understanding of what CEA and vertical farming does. Exactly. I think, for, for exactly. quality. And I think this is so important because I mean, this is like, we are not trying to kind of, you know, we just try to, to, to create better conditions and through better conditions that, that are better automated and better manageable, we can produce a better produce. And that's, uh, that's our approach at the moment. And, but I'm sure we can surely build on this moving forward, but this is the, the way how we build it at the moment. So. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Now I'm gonna move over to Larissa, but first I wanna say, Larissa, I was sinking my teeth into your introduction and I guess I don't wanna give a spoiler alert, but I really found it fascinating to hear your story and the journey you went through. Because I think for so many of us, when we eat food, it's something we don't have to think about that much, right? I, I don't have diabetes. I don't have any issues that I face on a consistent basis. So, you know, I can maybe watch my weight or things like that, or I can say, okay, this is maybe gonna give me energy, but honestly, it's like shooting in the dark. And you kind of capture that in the introduction. And if you have health challenges, you can't afford to shoot in the dark. And that's why personalized nutrition, it's sort of, the introduction opened it up for me. It's like, wow, it just, maybe sort of empathize for you and others that have to treat nutrition in a, in a different way as a scientific way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a great bridge into what we're talking about today. So can you share your story a little bit in your book? Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Henry. It's so great to be here with um, Jade and uh, Felix. Um, so I was diagnosed with type one diabetes when I was 12 years old and as a kid getting it, it was like, whatever, you know, I, I didn't really pay, you know, I, I obviously had to take insulin shots. This was back when, you know, you only did insulin shots um, 
pumps were just beginning. Um, it's funny because recombinant DNA, which many of the synthetic biology startups are using to make their, that, that method of how <clears throat> proteins are made is how insulin was starting, was just begun to be made when I was diagnosed at 12. Um, so I had humulin insulin when prior to that, it was made from pork, uh, pigs and cows. So um, being diagnosed with diabetes um, has led me down a path where, you know, I look at food from the inside out. I look at the macronutrients. I look at the protein, the fiber, the carbohydrates, the fat, because everything will affect how it comes into my body. Even my activity level will change it. Even my hormones that change monthly. So I just, I look at the minutia um, behind the food versus like, you know, seeing, seeing the luscious tomato, right? I think about what's in this tomato, right? This tomato is better for me to eat than um, if I was to eat, you know, tomato uh, leather in something else or like in a bar, you know? So they're very different. Um, and so personalized nutrition is like key to people like me. Like we really, we want to believe in the nutrition fact panel that we look at in the supermarket, and um, we know that they're that they that they're accurate, but they aren't accurate. We aren't a universal one person. We're all different, right? So it's this like we're all different, and how we eat um, is so important to our health. Um, it was one of the way, the reasons I wrote my book. And I think it's it you you actually say that in the intro too, right? When you go to the supermarket, you look for the nutrition label. And even then it's not even really adapted to your needs. And I think that's where it goes from just nutrition, basic transparency to personalized nutrition mm -hmm. and you know what the difference is that it's mm -hmm. something for everyone. And this panel is exciting for me because I studied urban agriculture and food security and at Ryerson University, which has this great online course on urban agriculture, food security. We talk about the five A's of, of food security. And one of them is that there's safe and nutritious food. It's not just about the volume of food. That's not what food security is. It also means that people like you and, and others can have nutritious food on a consistent basis. That is part of the food security vision we want to have. And the question is, you know, will vertical farming or other ag tech play that role? So Larissa, can you tell us a little bit more about your book and the thesis behind it, uh, give us a, a little bit of preview. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the one one piece of writing the book was who I am and what my needs are, and their and their and the scrutiny that I put on onto food, and I wanted to bring that to the to everybody. Um, and then the other reason I wrote the book was because everybody was coming to me and asking me, are these healthy? Are these good for me? I mean, maybe they just want to know if they were delicious or maybe they, or where they could buy it, right? The, the Koji bacon or, um, you know, uh, meat made from, from uh, um, lemna, like, you know, everyone wanted to know what was happening. And so I realized there was this like, a piece missing where I didn't know if these things were healthy for me. Um, and then I had everybody wanting to know more um, and food, you know, we, we, we want more transparency in our food system, but it, it felt like it would, all this technology was sort of clouding it over once again. And so we, we, I felt like Michael Pollan and Dan Barber had brought us to this great place and like the slow food movement where we really understood our food and then technology stepped in and complicated it. And I, um, technology looks at kind of uh, silos of solutions versus like a horizontal treatment where, you know, they're thinking about things holistically and everybody um, and every piece of the puzzle, right? So I wrote the book in the hopes of like breaking down um, I picked various ingredients that I thought were sort of the ones that were going to the up and comers like algae and mycelium, uh, vertical farms, pea protein, cultured meat. Um, so I picked, I picked, and I, and each chapter breaks down who are the startups that are, you know, involved, a few of those startups involved, how are they doing, making these foods, what does it mean for us, and I asked experts to, to weigh in and I try to break down, um, you know, where we're going um, in a way that um, people can like walk away knowing like what, what it is they're eating versus just like not thinking about what they're eating. Right. So I'm, I'm doing the thinking for you and the taste test. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say like, I liked that part of the structure of the, the chapters that it like covers different topics because I feel like it's almost like I can just dig into it and see what the latest is, but I'm still waiting for my hard copy coming. And on the tasting part, I, I just want to throw another plug. Your TikTok and your Instagram, when you try different food products is really fun. So if you want to have like a fun experience with like tasting all kinds of future foods, 
uh, Larissa's Instagram and TikTok is fun for that. Before we get into the questions, Larissa, I do wanna talk to Franz a little bit and uh, Jake coming up, because Franz, you mentioned in your bio that Food Rules was your favorite book and it's by Michael Pollan. So yes. I want, do you wanna talk about that and personalize it? Yes, actually I want to talk about this because I mean, it was one of the reasons why I actually joined uh, a vertical farming company because I, for me, the book changed everything. And I think it was so brilliant to actually, he wrote this book before that had, a, I think 800 pages and then he came up with this very small book that explains to me how you should like maneuver in a supermarket and that actually the whole food department in the supermarket is actually the most nutritious one and it's not this highly processed food uh, and also when I was traveling I was in, in Chile for a while and I, I could see like all the stickers where they, they, they mark actually ultra processed food there very clearly and for me, this is also like, and my, my girlfriend at the time, she also is, um, she was working as a, uh, in a, in a di diabetes a startup called My Sugar, which is actually like, so she was uh, training the, the di diabetes coaches on this. So I was, the diabetes theme is very close to my, uh, to my heart. And so I think what is really important here is what Larissa said is that transparency is the most important thing. And I think, uh, as you know, when you market a product, it's always great to be like to make it look really nice to the consumer. But I think you need to be also very honest and very clear what is this product, what is included in this product, and what is uh, actually happening uh, when you eat this product. And I think, especially with vertical farming, there's still this problem that we don't have so many certifications. It's like there's no organic certification and things like this. I think then it's even more to the task, I think, of the, of the company is to be very clear about this. What is actually, you know, how, how are we producing this product and how, what does this mean for your kind of food intake? And not only in terms of taste and crunchiness, but also what are actually, does it have higher proteins? Is it, you know, what are the things that are, and I think this is really important. And because if you don't, I think, the, ad the adaptation of vertical farmed products maybe will be slower than, than we in the industry are hoping for. And I think this, this is why if we could set an example here and be the first to be very transparent, and I think this could really help us in also in, ad in the adaption of vertical farmed uh, greens. I think that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, th I think the adoption point is good as well. Like it has to be driven by consumers and they have to see that value in it. But I think also... Again, I think it came from your newsletter, maybe Larissa, but it was like, we don't want new ag to become the same as big ag or something like that. And so that's part of the challenge, right? Is like, if we don't hold ourselves to a higher accountability, we're just repeating some of the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. Jade, what does personalized nutrition mean to you? Um, I think, you know, in relation to Vindara, like the ultimate goal would be, um, you know, being able to democratize the breeding selection process. So what, what does that mean? Like you just made this comparison between big ag and new ag. So, you know, who gets to make decisions on what traits are bred into what crops? I mean, it's not you at the consumer level. I mean, your choice is at the shelf or on the restaurant menu. So, you know, what if you had the ability to actually make a selection on your flavor preference or your texture preference, or maybe chemicals or nutrients that benefit you or don't benefit you? Um, so, yeah, that would be my moonshot ultimate goal is to kind of unlock the selection process at the consumer level and breed specific varieties for that. So I'm going to have my Google glasses walking <laughs> into the supermarket and, you know, to solve this problem that Larissa and all these people have, it's going to already direct me to the products that match my nutrition profile and the blood test I took earlier in the day, maybe. Yeah. Right. And the, and the vertical farm produce can stand out there. Maybe there's multiple options. I just that vision sounds sounds a bit fun. So, um, you know, why don't you tell us in the chat? I really love hearing where everybody's from. We've got a super international audience here today, which I'm grateful to have. I know some of you are joining at unusual times. So appreciate that. But let us know in the chat, like what does personalized nutrition mean to you? you know, why did you join this webinar? Like, how are you defining that? It'd be really interesting to hear uh, your stories a little bit as well. I'm checking periodically. But in the meantime, let's move into some questions. Uh, Larissa, I have to let you know, I did mix the order up a little bit. So follow my lead, follow my lead, okay? So the first one is gonna be for um, uh, the rapid fire questions from you. And then I'll ask the first question to Ann Ever. So I think you're gonna sort of challenge us. Am I included in the challenge, I think? Yep. So, yep. Yep. so walk us through it. Okay, 
So um, I, we're, I'm starting with some quick fire, which is like short answers. So let's start with Jade, quick fire. Um, is personalized nutrition, in personalized nutrition, which is more important, nutritional quality, local, or flavor? Nutritional quality. Okay, same question, Henry. Oh my gosh, I would say uh, <laughs> local distance to the customer would be the main driver for me. Okay, and France? I think it's the combination. So, but it's a little bit, that's unfair. Cheater, but, uh, cheater. <laughs> no, but I think nutritional value is actually more important than, than taste, I would say. Okay. At least for me, it's more important because you can always bring different kind of, you know, plants together to, to create a, a, a great taste. So I think it would be more important to me. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give my, my answer via Dan Barber's words, the chef from New York, which he would say that flavor equals nutrition, right? So if you've got yeah. flavor, you've got nutrition and you know you have it. Anyways, that's a little plug for the, what he talks about. Um, okay, Thank so you. next quick fire, we'll start with um, Henry first. Um, if you, um, what one fruit or veg do you wish was being grown indoors? I wish that strawberries were commercially indoors and they're getting there, but I just think that it's something that's so often imported and so often low quality that to me, it's something that I wish I could just trust. It always tasted delicious. And I just can't trust that right now. Yeah. Jade? Uh, I might go for blueberries. That's mine. Go oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Franz? Yeah, it's also blueberries actually. Ah, I love yeah. it. Is anybody working on it? Henry? I can't talk about that in detail, uh, but yes, people, people, people are working on it for sure. Okay, but great. It's, really, it's a much tougher crop than strawberries. It's just really mm. a, a lot more difficult. So we're, we're further away on that one for sure. Okay. I mean, um, I hear the strawberries are very hard. They are very hard, but they're easier than blueberries. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. I love it. Great, yeah. those are my questions. Great, awesome. Thanks for the rapid fire. We did not get those in advance, so we were not prepared for those. I love, I love it. So um, let's go over to Andever. And actually, this is a, an image, a background image of, of one of Andever's uh, systems. But Andever has put a lot of emphasis on selling living plants and developing smaller growth systems like this one here, which is, I think, in the HQ, mm -hmm. where the customer is. Can you help us understand the connection between freshness and nutrition? We talked about a little bit in the rapid fire. Yeah. And like why Endeavor is so focused on this aspect of getting closer to the customer. Tell us about it. Well, I think, I think our purpose is more like that we really want to create a hyper-local solution that is like... Uh, that allows us to create something very sustainable that saves a lot of transport costs and CO2 levels and things like this. And while doing that, uh, I would say almost a side effect is that the, the, if the product is not traveling for 2,500 kilometers, it only, if it only travels 30 meters, then it is of, of course much fresher. And also, as we know, you know, nutritional uh, kind of the quality decreases of a product. If, if you have, for example, a, a salad and it's it harvested in Spain and then it's shipped over to Germany, it's basically a dead, uh, a dead plant. And so the nutrition level goes down. Uh, and so this is something that we really were very focused on, that we want to, the, the, clo the closer we get to the point of consumption, the fresher the product is and that the more higher quality the product is. And this is, again, there's no, no big tricks and uh, uh, like uh, behind this, this is just normal biology that, you know, as soon as you cut uh, a plant, it's basically, it's, it's dead. And we are currently selling dead salad in our supermarkets. And what we try to do, especially with our latest technology with the Grow Tower and Best Ponics, that it's actually, you buy a living plant and it's watered and you can actually decide when you want to harvest it so you can harvest it like you can ha harvest half of the of the plant like today and two days later that the second half and it would stay alive and fresh and it would, would also regrow if you give it the time and i think this is the, the exciting part about it because we saw a lot of frustration also with our consumers that you know you buy half a kilo of salad and then it's it's rotting away in your and it's like it's more like biomass than it's not really a plant anymore uh, also, with so this was one of the reasons why we focused so much on this. Yeah, and I think actually this is, um, I mean, uh, Andever is doing this in a really unique way with the grow box here. But I, again, I did visit a farm in Lisbon, and here the roots are on it. Mm -hmm. I've got my little water, and the basil plant is there. And this will last, you know, 
seven days in my kitchen or more. And it's also something nice to look at and I can pick off of it. And so and I, I guess think the question- also just one I wanted to say is like it also, what I think is so fantastic about it is that, that we are able to recreate a connection between us and plants. I think- Yes, it's, that's another like, benefit. Right? If you know, if you, for example, the same with meat, I mean, if I know the cow, if I've seen the cow on, on the field, I have a different connection to the cow than I do when I just buy the steak. And I, I think it's the same thing. I mean, I've, I've, I'm currently growing like pak choy at home and I can't I can just not harvest the pak choy because I, I love the plants so much. They're so beautiful. So I think, and if, if we can bring this back to consumers to understand this is living organisms, this is not just like a piece of something, then this is another thing that really excites me about this. So, yeah. Any other comments or critiques from Larissa or Jade about living plants and this idea of, of selling them or should we move to the next one? I think I think the living plants and the more I've the more I've been thinking about it, the more excited I get about it. Um, I think people are a little confused by them, right? So there's I know that education isn't like truly needed, but you know, I told a friend about it last night and she said, like, oh, well, is it like do you have to plant it? Like, do you get it and you plant yeah. it? <laughs> um, so there's some elements of that. Um, also, you know, you can, if you just buy one, right, you have that cute basil plant that's fun. But like, what if you had 10 different things, right? What do you <laughs> yeah. do with them? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be able to get that. Like I live in California. So the quickest and fastest I can get something is from my farmer's market, but I would mm -hmm. love to have the option of trying something out like this. And, you know, I knew it was silly to ask and ever to send me, <laughs> to agree, but I, I was tempted. I was, I was a little tempted to ask. So yeah. But can you, Larissa, can you imagine if you, for example, that's where Mark is. Mark is on the plane delivering it right now. Oh yeah. Exactly. No, no, I just, <laughs> Just, just uh, here listening in. You're doing great, guys. I'm so sorry for, for being off on the sideline. Uh, um, Mark, welcome. Thanks, sorry Mark. for the background noise. Maybe I can it's just a... add one thought to it. I mean, so it's like Nick, next to the, all the hype on, on vertical farming, we all know it's also about the, the economic justification. And for me, this hyper-local approach is something that is very radically, uh, that's so important for vertical farms locally because we, are, we have the, the privilege to grow crops that would never fit the traditional value chain, the traditional cold chain. So um, whereas people can compete with us on price, but they will be very difficult for them to compete on variety and on, on, on the so-called so forgotten heirloom varieties um, that we can only grow locally because they will not be, be uh, suitable for cold chain. They will not be suitable for being stored days and days and days until they were finally consumed. So our privilege is to grow things that have to be consumed in a very small time frame, as we deliver in a very small time frame, and this is actually where um, one of the justifications for local grow towers is um, to to get this like. And I happily to name them. One of my great companies I admire is Farm One. Uh, I think they do an amazing job. Besides having the biggest farm in the world in Brooklyn, <laughs> but that's another topic. Um, but I think their their approach in the, having these 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 amazing different things that you would normally never find. This is, I think, where we have to go. And this is going to connect us to the consumer. And in Munich, people look at you when they when they eat for the first time wasabi or rugula, and they just can't believe it, that this is true, that this is legal, that this is something they can buy on an everyday base, because there's something they have never, never tasted in their whole life. And this, this is what was one of the key motivations also to do these hyper-local grow towers. Thank you so much, Mark, for, for joining in. We're going to continue. We see, hear a little bit of a baby in the background, so we're just going to continue a little bit further. Let's go and over to- the baby to, just left. Okay. <laughs> Let's go over to, to Jade. This one's for you to ask, Larissa. Yeah, Jade. Um, can you talk about the complexities of growing fresh foods and deciding where to focus your plant breeding? Um, so much of the plant is affected by things that happen after the seed is created. So the inputs like the light, the water, the fertilizers. How do you- how do you weigh all those things when you're breeding? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. You know, there's definitely a trade-off. You can't have the ultimate perfect crop. It's just there's not enough genome and space to build all the traits in that you, you want to and have that in your breeding program. So, I, you know, I truly believe that, you know, seeds for these systems, it's not a one seed wins approach, you know, for everything that you've mentioned, you know, light spectrum, modulated light. And, you know, we, we've seen some examples of this in, you know, programs that we've got. So, you know, our Romaine program, 
um, you know, we developed um, quite a few varieties and then we had winners in ambient CO2 and then we had winners in high CO2, which were, com which were completely different genetically. So we are seeing like changes that are influenced by these environments. So, you know, I think it has to be a tailor breeding approach. Um, you know, everyone has a different customer. Everyone has a different market. Everyone wants differentiation. Um, so, you know, it, I think one one seed in one system is not necessarily going to translate and get the exact prescribed outputs in a, in a different system. So it is a balancing act. Um, you know, we obviously, you know, want to win for the growers in terms of productivity, but then we obviously want to make sure that the consumers win too. So are you saying that we could have a, a future where every vertical farm was growing a different version of romaine? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Wow. What are um, some of those differences? Sorry, I want to understand like a little bit more of the, the length of that, right? Like how yeah, far so can I go? When you go through the breeding program and you have your, you know, your, what we let's call your training set and you, you know, you phenotype that training set. So you're phenotyping the environment. And when you think about, you know, breeding is, you know, genotype times environment. It's that's the interaction that gets you the phenotype, which is the characteristics. So in the E, you have such great control in these systems, but then very different systems, you know, whether it be hydroponic, aeroponic, you know, bioponic, dryponic, you know, we've got um, and over here. Um, and it, it, it's, you know, what we've seen is you can characterize and do that process of the phenotyping in one system and develop your breeding program around that, but it doesn't always translate. So the ideal scenario would be like, have a dedicated breeding program for your specific system. Mm -hmm. so so your jade your company was project was 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 acquired by calera so i know that you are focused on calera but that you're also you know you you mentioned you plan to sell seeds to the public so how how are you balancing that where you know you have a, a company that you're you know working for but other other clients still yeah, I mean, we have like, you know, that they have their, you know, their crops that are important to them, but we have nine programs, right? And some of those programs, they don't have any intention of bringing into those systems. So, um, and then, you know, we, we want to go, we want to go beyond, you know, we want to bring the next generation of leafy greens and like nobody's thinking about, you know, like next generation of micro. I mean, kale wasn't around as big as it is today, you know, many years ago, and it like kind of hit the map as the next like super green. But then beyond that, around, you know, high value niche products, you know, can we grow because we have such great control? Now can we, you know, in a P, can we create a protein that gets extracted that has a specific amino acid profile or functional proteins? Um, so I think, you know, those are the things that we're working on as well um, that will be options to bring to the market. Great, great. Thank you. So cool. Really excited about that. And we're getting some good questions in. Keep them coming. If you use the question tool, it's better. But if it's in the chat, we'll try to cover them too. We're observing those as well. But please try to use the question uh, feature. So next up, um, this question actually was proposed by you, Larissa, if you want to take it on, it might be helpful. Oh, but this right. is for and ever. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for the order switch. <laughs> and Mark, I hope you're still here. So um, you talked to me about the harvest on demand innovation, which I just uh, was really interested in. Um, basically, the plants are sold with their roots attached and you don't cut it, you don't kill it until you're going to eat it. Um, so you you talk about this as being ideal for the nutritional quality for the flavor. Um, do you think that the other players in the sector, you know, I mean, there's so many names, I won't mention them. Um, do you think they'll follow suit and copy you? Um, and um, can you share a little bit about how you sort of came up with the idea um, when you went to Whole Foods in Columbus Circle in um, yeah. Manhattan? Yeah, that's like, as, as um, thanks for the question. So um, back in 2015, I visited this, this Whole Foods in Columbia Circle, New York, and I saw this huge rack um, with the headline, um, locally grown. And I asked myself, do I really can, or can I be, or would I like to be number 256 on this rack? Um, also screaming down the aisle by me and your life will change or does it have to be something very different and that's when I realized it has to be harvest on demand because this is something that was missing everywhere there there was just one butterhead and it has a, a label on it organically grown in California and that was in Columbia Circle in New York and this is ridiculous <laughs> this is, has nothing to do with organic organic is a different mindset it, it, it's not it's not about transporting stuff 6,000 kilometers cross country. So that was where the idea of Harvest on Demand was born. 
that led me to defining dry ponics because for this we needed a specific uh, substrate that was very different to the soil-based substrates and other substrates that we have because if you want to deliver this to let's say my wife's kitchen um, please don't deliver anything with sticky algae please don't deliver big pots of, of soil um, make it kind of look nice and 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 also um, regarding the waste um, make it compact and so forth so that's how we discovered dry ponics we took us sometimes to make that work. So it's pretty difficult for me now to judge what others can do. What I know from, and Henry, please correct me if I'm wrong, you know everybody by heart, um, plenty with their zip growth system. I think for them, it's not possible, for, mm -hmm. at least I, I can't imagine it as of now, that mm -hmm. they would kind of deliver single heads as, 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 as living plants. Aero farms with their kind of, whatever this is today, the substrate they have, the carpet, the, the system i think also this is not really suitable the way they do it in order to deliver um harvest on demand whereas bowery is in the same position as we could we are they have a very open system where they could potentially grow everything and even if they would i wouldn't see this as a threat i would see this as happily that another company would be joining this initiative because i strongly believe in this harvest on demand because like even with kids you get this true response by suddenly they become um, they, they are curious, they, they eat that fresh salad that has never been refrigerated, never triple washed, and that makes a huge difference because the, the, the question you asked before about flavor and all of that, um, nutrients is flavor, that equals flavor, that was the correct answer. And if you wash half of that, this is the biofilm outside, if this is washed away, that definitely impacts your taste and the nutritional quality. So this non-washing fresh, and then there was a question by the audience about um, quality management, within the systems in completely closed climate cells as we do them and, and we test constantly. Um, and uh, so far nothing has been detected and I hope this keeps the way that um, will hinder us in, in selling harvest on demand products, whether as baby leaves or teen leaves or single heads. And, and in your, yeah. you, oh, sorry. sorry, have you ever had to close down your, your plants at all because of something that got well, in a bug? That was the other company. No, we never had, and we tested. Um, we tested really not only what we do. We do continuous swap tests. We swap test like everything within the farm, the benches, the walls, the the HVAC systems. We 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 consecutively take the the like like tests. We we monitor and and measure even at what we did in the beginning in Hamburg. We went to our customers. We measured um, the, the, the 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 measurable content there, and it was always fine. I think the problem mostly occurs also in if others deliver a harvest on demand products in retail. I've seen videos from German retailers where people sometimes tend to, to touch tomatoes openly displayed produce 20 times before person number 22 decides to finally buy it. Until then, 20 other people had rejected this product and placed it back with their hand on the shelf. So I think this is much more a source of contamination, which is completely out of our control than um, something that happens within our value chain. Yeah, one more, one more follow-up, which is that with Henry's point at the very beginning, which is access um, and equity, like these premium greens are all more expensive everywhere um, and they are precious, right? And they're, they're I don't wanna say that things have to get cheap and to become commodity prices, but how, how does the vertical farm sector, because there's so much money invested in it to get it off the ground, how do you deliver something that everybody can enjoy? Yeah, that's again when I would like to point out to Farm One how they do it and how, why I admire them. Um, and I hope we will do this and with the support of Franz and his team, I'm sure we're getting there. But the thing is really like the category salad is saying nothing. It's like the category car. And we all know in any category, whether it's butter, jam, anything you can imagine, there's cheap, there's um, very cheap, and there's even cheaper, and you always find somebody who, who will beat you on price, but there's tons of other things that we enjoy. And if you, we just talk strawberries, I mean, Henry said like, um, it's always disappointing. Yeah? Anywhere you go, if you go to retailers, you buy these strawberries, it's always a disappointment. So I'm saying, let's forget about this price discussion. It's value for money, and the value we deliver is the taste. And our taste is, and that's not just us, that's many in our sector, is absolutely superior. Um, the product we deliver is superior and people are willing to pay that price. We are not relatively more expensive, meaning this, the identical product just costs more. That would be kind of, we would be bankrupt quickly, but we, we, are, we are like in, the, in this huge category of greens, 
yes, there's like fancy things like Wasabi Rocket. I mean, um, yes, if you want to have Wasabi Rocket and if you enjoy Wasabi Rocket, you pay for this. If I want lovely ice cream uh, with lots of cream and whatever, I buy that and I don't care whether this is kind of, there's cheap alternatives. I'm, 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 food is always about enjoying it. And uh, like what is also changing in the meat sector is people now more and more understand either to stop eat meeting at all, which is the best alternative. But if they stick to meat, then at least they reduce their, their daily consumption and maybe enjoy once a week a, a steak that would cost 10 times the amount what they used to pay in the past because they had discovered that this quality aspect to it is relevant. And if you look at Nespresso, I mean, you pay 60 euros the kilo and I'm sure you can get uh, any coffee in the world for five euros the kilo. Um, so let's stop by saying, the, let's don't, be squeezed into this commodity corner. We don't deliver a commodity. We are not delivering um, soybeans or potatoes or, or wheat, which is then a half-baked cookie, which has to be kind of industrially processed. We deliver a product that you can consume. And our mustard mix, for instance, doesn't need any dressing. You can literally eat it raw and it's just a delight. And for this, you pay a decent price, but I wouldn't say you pay more compared to what? And a bag of salad is not a is not an item. It's just it's like a, a parking lot full of cars that doesn't tell you anything about the the cars or, or how they differ. So we need to be more precise in also in also communication on what are we actually growing. And it's not more expensive. It's just the right price for a superior product. Thank you so much for those thoughts. I'm going to transition a little bit. And I actually want to comment a little bit on this question that was brought up by Mark. Um, you know, what I see, I think harvest on demand is unique the way that Andever is doing that. Uh, absolutely. But there are a couple of other companies trying it. And what I see very often is the startups try it because it's an easier way for them to differentiate in the market fast. It also prevents them from having to have processing on site. It also, in many, in some cases, um, you can actually get away with being licensed as a nursery because you're selling young plants. You're not selling a cut food. So that means you can avoid certain food safety requirements. Wow. And you can, think what, you can think what you want about that, but that's a huge advantage to startup farmers. And actually, if you think about it, I mean, I'm not a plant scientist, but the plants themselves are more subject to contamination, as Mark mentioned, when they're washed and when they're cut than if they're alive. So it does help in some, in, in some ways. So there's a lot of advantages. I see a lot of startups across the world trying that in their early stages. Scaling it is a, is a bigger challenge. So let's go on to the next one with Jade. I'm gonna take this one. This was your question, Marisa, but I'm gonna take it, it's okay. A lot of vertical farms have said that the seeds are used, used to breed. Sorry, let me start again. Um, a lot of vertical farms have said the seeds used are bred for outdoor agriculture and that if bred for indoor agriculture, they would perform a lot better. Can you break down the science for this, Bob, this for us a little bit more and also help us explain the, understand the potential especially in the context of nutrition, but also just for the bottom line of these farms. Yeah, I mean, you know, traditional breeding programs for outdoor products have, you know, wholly been focused on input traits. And, you know, these traits include disease resistance, pest resistance, and durability to withstand the long um, supply chains before it actually reaches the customer or the consumer. Now, if you consider the whole genome, like a large part of that genome is locked up on the genes that code for those specific traits. So, in you know, in any breeding program we talked about this g by e interaction so for in, in you know in the in indoor systems where you can unlock this other part of the genome and switch on genes that are activated by these different light protocols recipes everything else and now you have much much better control and you can focus on output traits which are relative to flavor nutrition and texture and things like that so I mean, we're seeing on, on the agronomic side, um, you know, things like number of leaves, fresh mass, like yield, right? Those things. We're seeing right. quite big step changes and in increases in those. Um, so I think what has to happen is we have to get to what we would call our pedigree lines. And then from the pedigree lines, we go on and breed for, you know, more focus on nutrition and flavor and texture. Whereas today it's been like, you know, can we bring a benefit to the growers and help, you know, like the, the sector as a whole um, in improving the unit economics. But essentially we're leveraging, you know, genetic diversity going back many, many, many years. And if you think about a pyramid of elite genetics, we're at the very, very bottom and creating a brand new pyramid specifically for these types of systems. So really cool. Do you think, 
Yeah, go ahead, Mark. No, I just I just thought this is what, what Jay just said is for me the most crucial part because for, for now what has been selected was mainly based on phenotyping and the criteria didn't come from the consumer. It came always from the retailer and from the, the whole processing. Uh, and, and this is now changing. The consumer is in the driver's seat more and more, um, not only in our sector and many other sectors. And the thing is we can we can now go back 50 years and say like all the Spanish varieties, all the varieties have been kind of selected or, or not selected because they were lacking certain characteristic phenotyping characteristics where we were simply radically eliminating a huge gene pool. Uh, pool. So now we can go back to that. And um, and 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 we, one advantage we have over, over open fields and with these new varieties is that we have a very consistent climate. We can replicate that, that result week by week, grow, crop cycle by crop cycle. Whereas if, as John Purcell once said, like if the weather wouldn't be the enemy of the farmer in many regions of the world, they could also do great products um, disregarding transport, and everything else. But the thing is, most time it's either too dry, too wet uh, and all of that. So the, the gene, the, the genotyping and silico breeding, these are the methods that the Jay talked about. And I think this is the future for us, um, identifying those that are kind of relevant to our market and not just based on phenotyping, which is an essentially, how does it look like two, year, two weeks after harvest on the shelf, which was the key driver in, in selecting crops based on phenotyping criteria. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in the idea that you could you know, grow more density, I mean, because I, I look at the business case for vertical farming a lot, but in addition to the personalized nutrition piece, you know, could you actually grow more density? Could you make them grow shorter so you could stack more various advantages? Uh, Jade, are we going in that direction? I, I think you sort of said yes, but I want to- Yeah, right. you know, I think so. I mean, and you've seen like all the different types of systems and it's very differentiated. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, ultimately is, you know, if, if it's food service versus retail, like what does that end product need to look like? So. You know, it could be, you know, a shorter growth cycle, um, which impacts the unit economics, but then it could be the same growth cycle, but a larger plan. But then that doesn't always translate to the business needs. So it just depends. Like it's very, very segmented. Awesome. I actually, we're going to move into some questions briefly for a moment from the audience, um, just to play it up a little bit. And I want to let everyone know we do have an after hours. We're probably going to go a little bit, 10 minutes over. So hang around as we dive into your questions a little bit deeper. But this one's for you, Jade, and I think it relates to, to what we're seeing here. So um, Jade, how limited are you from developing new cultivars for CEA production because of the expense for breeding and with the limited ROI by sales and industry that's still relatively small in production agriculture? From Gene Giacomelli, uh, who, who uh, if you don't know, is a very well-known CEA expert. So I think the question there is, look, the vertical farming CA sector is still quite small. Yep. Breeding is expensive. You know, what's the business case for that? Is it going to be worth it? Yeah, I mean, you have to get volume. Um, but then if you have differentiation, you can charge a premium, right? And, you know, and, you know, we think about traditional breeding and that's a five to seven year cycle. Now using indoor systems as part of your breeding program, this is extremely accelerated. So we're able to get to market, you know, we've, we've developed new varieties in, in just 18 months and then scaled commercial seed production in an additional five months. So it, you know, the, the costs that sunk into this, if you think about like a breeding program are much more reduced. Um, but I think as we go through and we can differentiate the products and, you know, we talked about different types of systems. I mean, if you think about the input costs at the farm and, um, you know, the last numbers that I saw was about 3% is like attributed to seed. Now, traditionally, that number is 10%. And if we bring mm. a value, you know, in terms of profitability, then we kind of do a share on the profits by the increase in, in the, um, you know, the cost of the seed itself. So, super interesting. I think very valuable knowledge you're sharing there, Jade. Appreciate that uh, to help us understand breeding, how it works, the time it takes, et cetera. But I guess the follow-up question relates to sort of what Larissa and I were talking about, you know, and I think Mark made his point about, let's stop talking about cost, but is it going to be a premium product always? Is the personalized nutrition a, a premium experience in the future, or can it be more democratized in the case of vertical farming? 
Yeah, I mean, look at you know the, the big costs, right? A lot of those are going to come down with time, the technology costs. I mean, you look at what's happened just in the LEDs in the last 10 years. So I think as those yeah. costs, you know, those costs keep coming down and we can actually breed specific varieties that have like great agronomic attributes or, you know, we can build in architectural traits that, you know, make it good for automation, for harvesting. So you can kind of eliminate some of those challenges there. So yeah, I mean, I, I I think that it's it's the costs of costs are coming down, and you know, like there's more new things, technologies like you know they talk about the dry ponics. There's going to be advances in you know the the growth media, you know maybe changes in the nutrients. Like what can we do there? Um, right. But yeah, I do believe that we're going to get to a point where you know, I mean, that's the goal, right? Like why should it just be like a premium product? Like everyone should have, everyone should be able to go and buy a head of lettuce and know that it's eco life free. <laughs> Yeah, it should be Henry, safe. Henry, can yeah. I ask everyone? Can I ask yeah. everyone how many of you guys have have taken vitamin pills or regularly take any kind of food supplements? I take something Honest for answer. my bald my bald spot. I use I take a vitamin <laughs> every day, and actually, it's you quite see? effective. It's working. It's changed my life. It's I I'd recommend it to everyone. But that's what yeah, I but, take. That's, now, that's the motivation. But, but just now, imagine that if you would transfer this and and say like by eating a proper diet with lots of micronutrients because they're all in there. Uh, it, it, if, if you and then compare the cost of these food supplements and this is a huge market out there and everybody like ha is happy to participate in this market selling vitamin pills and all of that and people spend a fortune on that. So I think what it's all about is like people to get them aware of how much is actually in that food. And I think many people don't trust the industry anymore because they read so much about, I don't know, all kinds of, 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 of things. And this is one of our challenges. How do we get across that a salad is not a plate filler topped by chicken and French dressing, but a salad is actually in itself something extremely valuable. If you talk to the companies like Viome or, or Zoe in England who do microbiome gut um, testing and recommendations and just ask these scientists on, on how important plant-based diets are for your gut microbiome system. And that has a huge effect on your, on your health. It's a long story, I know, but it has to start somewhere. And our advantage is to deliver such products and maybe reduce all of that, that crazy supplements that, that everybody is happy to, to. And I've never been in, in a pharmacy comparing prices to like, mm, maybe, I don't know, $30 for, uh, I don't know, XYZ vitamin pills might be too expensive. I'm trying to do something good for my body and let's get that thought into plant-based food. And so like, guys, you're actually doing something great for your body. So don't see this always as a commodity, a salad that just fills a plate, then this yeah. is iceberg. And this is what we will never be, be able to challenge because it's not even a salad. It's just like some rotten biomass that is not worth discussing. And sorry to being so, so French on this, but it's, uh, it's not the way forward. No, I think it's a really, I, I think it's a really great point. Um, you know, I think that if people really understood that the greens that they were eating or what they were eating was replacing a supplement. I mean, I don't trust a lot of the supplements, but I said, I, I tried it and it worked for me, but you know, the, the, if I could trust that in food, that would be a better situation, you know, but I think that that understanding isn't there. It's not mature. That technology hasn't necessarily advanced. Um, this was one of the questions for the audience. It's for and ever as well. So I'm just going to bring it up here. Like they want to understand what is that relationship in CEA that can actually drive nutrition beyond it being local, like from a technology perspective, what's happening um, maybe beyond the seeds, but what's happening in CEA systems that, that could potentially drive nutrition briefly. Yeah, it's just like um, reducing plant stress um, as best as we can, because plant stress um, in, in nature, whether it's cold or rain, and in order to make give you a brief answer, reducing plant stress enhances um, the overall nutritional profile of, of a crop. Jade, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that is my belief. Jade, any comments on that? It's, I think it's balancing plant stress, not just reducing it. It's like creating stress at the right time too for yeah, flavor. I agree. And yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. if you if you're pumping in CO2, they're not really used to that, so it does kind yeah. of stress it. And the stomata open, but more light gets in. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But the main the main point is that you have more control, right? And you're paying for that a certain extent with a greenhouse, and you're paying for that a lot more with a vertical farm. But you get maximum control. The more systems, the more lighting, the more climate control, the more ventilation. And then when we move into seeds and nutrients, we're starting to get even more precise. That's the that's the hope. That's the vision. That's the direction we're going. Um, so let me see what other questions do we have. If I I'm going to pick some of these. 
Um, Henry, I, I forward you the, the, the slide and I don't know if you can raise it, but, but this at least, we have some scientific data that using dry products- We looked at it at the beginning, and, Mark. Yeah. Okay, sorry. We looked at the sorry. beginning, okay. no problem. Um, let's ask this one a little bit more for uh, Vindara a little bit, if it's okay. Uh, this one was from you, I think, Larissa. Do you wanna oh, yeah. ask it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jade, um, sorry. So uh, plant breeding takes years um, and uh, that's with the help of technology, which is accelerating. So it, it, it maybe will speed up as we go along. How are you handling weighing, you know, we've sort of lightly talked about this already, but the different priorities, um, because we saw plant breeding go down this path already and kind of it's returned um, plants that uh, seeds that grow on the ground and it's all focused on yield and pest resistance, right? So how do you, how do you weigh quick growth cycle, yield, freshness, the light needs um, without missing, um, you know, like what we've said, nutrition and flavor? Yeah, I think, you know, like right now we've been very focused on the customer, which is the grower and, grower and the farmer. And, um, you know, we kind of, it flows through to us on what their consumers want. Um, so, you know, the ultimate goal, like, you know, I said at the very beginning was, you know, if there was enough consumers that made a selection on a variety that had certain traits, you know, could we actually go breed that? And it was kind of like a crowdsource selection process. Um, I think that's a little bit of the unknown and, you know, there definitely are, you know, trade-offs, um, you know, on the agronomic side versus, you know, trying to build in all the traits for things like, you know, like flavor profiles and nutrition. Um, but I think, you know, we have to get more to the consumer centric traits, but then not forego the, you know, the unit economics in these systems. Now, if there's an opportunity to kind of charge a premium, and because it's like a brand new novel crop, you know, that's never been out there before, then, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to do a selection on a crowdsourced approach and then breed it and then actually have a, a you know, a grower grow it under some sort of like contract grow type arrangement. But yeah, it's definitely, it's a, it's a tough balance. I mean, we, you know, ultimately we're not going to design a variety that we don't have somebody to sell a seed to. So, you know, we're, we're very early and that's the stage that we're in, but I think, you know, ultimately the goal would be, you know, to kind of have, which is what we're working on right now, build something similar to, um, you know, like a, an Alexa type system or a Siri or a Google and, um, you know, actually have people go in and design specific crops for themselves. Thank you for that. That's really interesting as well. We got some good questions coming up, which means we are going to move into after hours. So I really appreciate the engagement. But for those of you who are signing off because you have another meeting, uh, this will be recorded, we'll get it to you, but stick around. We wanna make sure we get through some more of your questions. But thank you so much for attending if you are signing off and definitely check out all these amazing companies and panelists. But next up, we got a question for you, Larissa. I sent it over to you on the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this you want to tackle that? Yeah, yeah, this question comes from a favorite professor that um, uh, Henry and I are both big fans of. Gene Giacomelli is a professor at the University of Arizona. Um, his question, making more nutritious veggies does not mean that a consumer can absorb and utilize those nutrients. It's actually one of the problems that supplements face. So one study at University of Arizona found high lycopene tomato was not beneficial to the eater consumer. And this is such a good point because a Japanese company just came out with a tomato that had high GABA content, right? And a tomato already has high GABA. So are we getting that? Um, so I think this question is for Jade. Um, what, do you, what do you think? Um, I agree. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we do a lot of metabolomics, but we don't really fully understand the interaction when somebody's eating the food. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation for probably someone a lot more intelligent than me <laughs> but the um you know we know what the nutrition content is when it x is x is the farm um, and when it's on the shelf and um you know that's kind of like what we hold ourselves to but but you're absolutely right it's like you know we, we're not going to go in and say okay we're going to add this amount of like vitamin content because we know it's going to value like every, it's going to be valuable to everybody because we just don't know that i think there needs to be a lot more work a lot more studies on those interactions on um, the nutritions. And I mean, everybody's completely different. So I'm not even sure how it would translate yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah so there must be so many factors, right? I mean, and I guess the blood testing piece may fix that, right? Like, I mean, do does anybody here see a future where the vertical farms are actually involved in the relationship with the customer directly to understand what's happening with me? 
so that they're matching. Because because I, I think we can all get behind the fact that vertical farms could produce more nutritious food and are already. And if it's closer, I think we, we, can, we are there and breeding can drive that even further and customize it. But this question is really important. You know, will it actually make a difference in the human being's body, right? If we don't understand that relationship between the nutrients in the plant and the absorption. And, and I was reading a bit about this, you know, that personalized nutrition is largely defined by understanding what's happening with the individual as well, that there are startups testing blood, et cetera, trying to understand glucose levels, trying to understand what happens when you eat something in the reaction. Do you think that vertical farming companies might get in on this? What, what, what are the panel's thoughts? Mm. And my initial thing, I mean, I did the, you know, 23 me and the things that stuck out was things, you know, like the likeness for cilantro, right? That was something, you know, whether you have a likeness or, I'm like, okay, well, how is that coded? And it, does that mean that there's a certain chemical in there that's in like other, other kind of crops or, you know, is it a combination or is it an olfactory thing? Like it, I was quite curious around that, but I think, you know, to have that kind of information, on like preferences on liking and disliking and trying to backtrack that to what the flavor profiles could be. I would see that as a more Im immediate kind of step rather than, you know, how could we, you know, dial in onto, you know, like on the nutrient side and that, that nutrient interaction for absorption, things like that. I think that's a really cool comment because, you know, I was watching, I think a Vox explained video about like sugar and how we're genetically engineered to like really enjoy sugar. Um, and that that's something for hard for us to escape, but like our body knows, like we do also, if we listen to ourselves, we sometimes know, maybe not if you're experiencing diabetes, but like you sometimes know if that's gonna be good for me, right? And like your preferences do matter and listening to those preferences are a way that your body is sort of telling you what might make an effect on you. Like I do, I do actually believe that. Is that kind of what you're saying, Jade? Is that that might be the first part is just- Yeah, sort of I would like say reference. that's, yeah, more of you know, that, more on a likeness rather than like this actual like, interaction. Yeah, I would say that would be the first thing that we would run after. Cool, so this next question from the audience sort of relates to this. It's how easily will it be for us in vertical farming to work with registered dietitians on collaborative testing and recommendations instead of, pumping sup the public pumping supplements, right? This discussion of vitamins, like how do we overcome that? I mean, the supplement industry is enormous, right? We're talking about a huge market, huge yeah. benefit there that vertical farming companies could get into. What, what, how do we see that playing out and, and relating to these RDs that are, you know, I think a legitimate connection between that. Any ideas, Larissa or France or Mark? Yeah, people need to see, they need to understand if they have a clear benefit. And then people, if they see they have a, a definite benefit, they will do whatever is needed um, to achieve just that. If it's just very broad and vague, uh, we, we might take a profile, but we don't really know where this is leading us. But I was once at a conference um, where people were asked to give like, um, uh, it was kind of a gene test. And I was stunned how many people were willing to do this for some kind of a benefit. I don't, I have even forgotten what it was. But people, if, if they see the benefit, um, people are really willing to do it. And I think what we have to focus on first um, is to create these these products to find these these varieties um, to be able to to grow them in a, in a very efficient uh, cost efficient and sustainable way this is our main focus for the time being but on the other hand um, we are influenced by these consumers who who ask these questions and they want answers and we can give them to them by quickly analyzing for instance on on in the microfluidic way we are now able to kind of quickly analyze our our the, the sub and and to tell you quite exactly what is in that crop and this will advance with spectroscopy or spectrometers, you will quickly get more answers on what are you actually eating. And with all the microbiome testing, you will get a good understanding whether broccoli is good for you or whether broccoli is really bad for you. And, um, and there are so many great books about the immune system and how this all functions and it's just overwhelming. But I think more and more people have either the time, the money to get into this and, and are very open. And again, what I said first, if they see the clear benefit to them, they will give us the data, not maybe us, but the dietitians, and then uh, we will supply the food that is hopefully much better to them than what is currently delivered. I mean, there's something that I'm was been thinking about before is that we also are experimenting at the moment with this, with this idea that we are using, for example, like 30 times 40 centimeters, uh, and we grow different kind of like uh, produce on it, so different types of greens, and. This was a little bit to the, to the question, uh, if I have 10 different pots now in my kitchen, how do we gonna work this out? But if you have it like in this kind of squarish kind of uh, thing, 
then you could actually mix different varieties together. And if you think this to the to the to the end, what would be a logical progression of this is that we at a certain stage could even have like you know subscription services where we offer like this 30 times 4, 40 centimeters uh, with different kind of mixtures of different greens, which would be then aligned to the to the nutritional needs of the of the person that has a subscription. And for me, this would be like a, a dream coming true because then we could actually offer, for example, if I have a certain condition and I need, for example, a, a higher a percentage of iron, for example, we could basically just create this like in greens rather than in us vitamin supplements and pills. And I think this is something I'm not saying saying we're gonna launch this in next year, but I think in, in three to five years, this could be something that could be available. And then we are just using an existing technology to also offer this not only to people that like are super rich, but to like to everybody. And if you just think about this, this could be like also one of the reasons why a, a hyper local a green supply would be so interesting because you could actually personalize your nutrition in a way that uh, you know is is really completely unique to yourself, you know. And this would be for me, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this technology because we are at the moment really at, at the beginning and we can so many things we can create without you know without like playing God, but just by, you know, playing, yeah. you know, breeding things uh, in a certain I, way. And you know, so, yeah. I have a comment on some of the things you said, Franz, but in a moment, let, let's just go to Larissa. What are your, what are your thoughts on this question? Well, I, I still think there's this um, education moment that we're missing, right? The need for people to understand that um, they're getting vitamins and nutrients from the food that they're eating, depending on where that food is coming from and the processing. So, you know, I think we need to go back to education and to schools at a very young level. We need people to be taking food classes, right? And how, how kids would love it, right? And they, they do exist, but they need to be everywhere. And we need stronger education programs. We need government funding for, um, you know, so that, so that all the level, all the strata of level of um, income can afford to buy these foods. And we also need need greater transparency from the companies making the food. So with, with these three things working together, right? Government um, spending so that people can afford to buy these foods, greater education so that people get, get why they're eating these foods, and then companies that are really sharing um, how they're making their food, what the inputs are, and then yep. data around you know, what, what they see in their foods, you know, even, even as a journalist, I don't get these questions answered. Mm -hmm. So if I can't get these questions answered, you know, the lay consumer won't get the questions answered. So greater transparency will. Um, and I also think I would add a fourth thing to you, to what you said, Larissa, says also, we need to bring the nutrition levels up in, in the industrially farmed food again. If you look at, I mean, this was one of the questions also of the people joining this webinar. I mean, like if you look at all the, the, the produce, there has been a massive decline in nutritional levels in the last 100 years because the whole industry has been focused on yield and results. And I think if, I mean, if I just look at wheat, for example, wheat had much higher proteins 100 years ago. And now we are, so we have bigger, bigger, faster and stronger, but it's not, it's not tasty and not more nutritious. So I think there's also a need for us to bring this back again and say, guys, uh, it's fantastic that you have a, a very resistant crop here, but why, why has it 40% less nutritional uh, le levels? And I think this is also something yeah. that I think the producers need to co come back with. And maybe vertical farming can help here, but I think it's a general discussion. I mean, then we have food waste on the other hand, you know, people are, do we really need this large amount of food, you know, could we just scale it back, have higher nutrition levels? And, you know, so this is also, I think, one of the biggest questions at the moment, I think, in addition to- Yeah, the and, and on that question of nutrition going down in traditional agriculture, there's a lot of reasons why it is, but I, I, interesting reading, if you want to look it up, is about barley and wheat and reductions due to increased CO2 in the atmosphere and how climate change will drive lower nutrition in traditional okay. agriculture is, is, is an interesting one to look at and a bit scary as well. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to comment a little bit on what was said about this question because it does remind me a little bit about the vaccine, right? This is something that's good for people's health 
And without the right education, without the right marketing, people still don't do it, even if the data suggests it's, it's going to really help you. And so I think that there's a connection there during this, this crazy time of this pandemic that mm -hmm. seems endless about just even when the data is there, it's not enough. Misinformation, it can really affect this. And so good marketing, your really job, your job of France is, yeah. yeah. What I would really agree with Larissa, I think is like once people would understand how nutrition and vitamins and everything works and they know it from, uh, from 10 years old or 12 years old, they would ask the questions. They would go into, they would vote with their dollars. They would say, hey, uh, sorry, but this product is not, it's not food. You know, it's like, it's something different. I, I, so I think, I think starting there would be also a really important thing. So I would fully agree with that. This is also something, really, also, yeah. Really a lot, a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and I just wanna thank all our panelists for their engagement today. I like to give my panelists one sort of call to action at the end before I do the wrap up. So Jade, what's your call to action? Is there a website? Is there something you want the audience to do? Let them know. Yes, yeah, so, you know, we, we're not, we're not been like a marketing engine. So www.vindara.com <laughs> and there's a link on there, contact us and we can, you know, get you some seats. Awesome, great. What about you, Franz? I think, yeah, just come visit our website. If you are uh, like endeavor.com, it's like and minus ever.com because we cannot put like the, the plus sign uh, on, the, on the internet yet. We're talking to Google, but they're not on letting, letting us. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, just look it out. And you can also learn more about our technologies there because there have been some people asking, what is Triponics? How does it work? So just come to our website. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and to me or to, to, to Mark. Uh, we were more happy to, to continue the discussion with you guys. Excellent. Thank you both, Franz and Mark. And Larissa? Yeah. I mean, buy my book, please. Uh, you can find it at <laughs> itstechnicallyfood.com. And the book's available everywhere. It's in audio. I narrate it and Kindle and hardcover. Um, and you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, it's technicallyfood.com. And my Instagram handle and TikTok is at technicallyfood.food. Um, and you can see me be a goofball, uh, which um, Henry can attest to. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I really want to thank all of you. You know, um, if you have questions that weren't answered today, you're welcome to contact me directly on LinkedIn or Twitter, the Agritect and I'll do my best to answer your questions. I take it really seriously, so feel free to engage. I also wanna just plug Agritecture Designer, which is Agritecture's farm planning software, the first of its kind. Maybe you have questions about greenhouses, vertical farms, what's the yield, how many jobs, what's the energy use, water use. Agritecture Designer answers those questions in minutes. You just have to input your own information about your location. So whether you're in the United Kingdom like Charlie or Al Naman in Oman, we have answers for you. Check out Agritecture Designer, you can start for free. Thank you again to all of our attendees and our amazing panelists. Really appreciate your time today and exploring this topic of personalized nutrition and vertical farming. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, Andrew.